and welcome. My name is Christina Lee. Um, a, I'm going to start with a fun fact about this presentation, which is that for the first time in my life, my mom is actually here watching me. She wanted to know, yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, she wanted to know that all that money for college actually paid off. So if you recall the bribes that I promised for enthusiastic applause and audience participation, yeah, they're going to be on the left side of the door when you leave. So, like I said, my name is Christina Lee, and thank you for coming to my talk, which is about representing state. The Kotlin version, of course. Now, if you wandered in here by mistake, I'm sorry, you're stuck now. But hopefully, you came here knowing what this talk was about. And specifically, there was this sentence in my abstract. And it talks about how representing state might be difficult and the ways I'm going to talk about how we can make it better. But of course, because people know me pretty well and I'm an open book, they have a lot of ideas about things that I like. And you know, chief among them, this one. Yeah. So, of course, when I said I was going to be talking about something related to state, they immediately said, I cannot wait to hear about UDF for your new state management machine. But as fun as it would be to talk about those things, that's not what this talk is actually about. Because those things, those are the mountains of state management. Those are the huge architectural pieces, the decisions that you make once and revisit at most every couple years unless something's going on in your company, in which case there are bigger problems. But there's a lot of content around this because making the decision is so important, and it leads to us overlooking some of the more nuanced, zoomed-in details. Specifically, sometimes we don't dive as deep into these tiny cross-sections. And by seeing the mountains, we miss the stones. We miss all of those grains of dust, the grains of sand that make up those mountain ranges. So this talk, this talk is about sand. Now, the format of this talk is like an upside down pyramid. It's going to start really small. It's going to start with a single primitive, an evaluation of it. And from there, we're going to slowly widen out and widen out up until we get a bigger state representation. So with that, let's dive in. Now, I need some audience participation, which I know is your favorite thing to do. So get excited. It goes a little something like this. True or false? True. Any other answers? Anybody going for false? Anybody? False. Thank you. All right. So you all are brave, and you dove right into that. Uh, and so if I told you now that the thing that I was talking about is the statement, dogs are amazing. All right. So some people changed their answers. Some people stayed. OK, so that was pretty easy. But let's try this one on for size. True or false? <laughs> so that level of gamesmanship that you just had, that was actually my exact point. There was a pause there where you were wondering if I was the type of person that would try to hot swap something positive with something negative. And of course, I am that type of person. So that was a very well-founded belief. However, the point stands, which is that when I asked the question the first time and immediately gave you the context on it, it didn't matter that you had just received that context when I asked it the second time, because you still weren't sure in the second instance what I was talking about. Was it the same thing? Was it different? You had no idea. Now, I can do other mean things, too. I can ask you questions like this. Is the restaurant open or not? And of course, this is a binary question. It should be answerable with a true or false. We have two possibilities. But of course, it's also really ambiguous. It's not great grammar, but people ask things like this all the time. And you don't know whether you're responding to the first part of that clause or the second part. And that leads to the second interesting observation, which is that the way in which a question asks heavily influences the answer that you give. Most astonishing of all, the same idea, it can be encoded using both true and false. Now, if we apply De Morgan's law, you'll see this on the slide right now, which is that we can have some value that says is yellow equals true. And we can apply that negation, and we can have is not yellow equals false. This is pretty wicked. 
And so it gets us to this point where we start thinking, what do I need to make sense of Booleans? What is it? And, and here are some things you might need. You might need to know uh, where is it coming from? Is it always the same representation of a value? Like how is the question being asked? And what all of these bits of data are pointing to is the provenance of the bool that you're using, where it's coming from. And, you know, bools by nature, they don't give us a lot of information. The lowest signal form of a bool is something like this, where we have bool equals true. And there's very little actionable things that we can do with a statement like this. So a lot of us, instead, we do things like this. We add context to bools in various ways, either with comments or by pulling them into named fields or by using a really great IDE by, I don't know, JetBrains. And you get these things in line for free. But this is great, and this is what most of us rely on. But the issue with some of this is that the meaning of these pools in all three scenarios, it's coming from something that's not at all tied to the type. It's coming from documentation. Now, we're all fortunate, because we know that documentation is always correct. <laughs> it's a lucky turn of events, I know. Um, <laughs> But for real, this is actually a problem that we have. And I'm basing all of the examples today on code that I've either written or reviewed or seen, because I don't want this to be theoretical. I want it to be infinitely practical. And so I worked on a project once to add video streaming to an app. And just one Boolean in this app went through eight or nine iterations. You can see in its most simple form, it starts with, are you in the experiment group for adding this feature? And then it goes through all of these different permutations. Are you on Wi-Fi? Do you have the setting checked? Is another video playing, et cetera, et cetera. So you can imagine if in version zero I added a comma or a comment, by the end, there's a good chance that that comment has drifted a little bit. Maybe it's still mostly accurate, but give it time and it'll be completely gone. Now, this is problematic because what we've just discussed is the fact that context is really necessary to understand primitives like bools, but there's nothing about the type that enforces it. It's not tied to that. It's all optional. And so this concept that I've been beating around the bush for, this is actually given a phrase called Boolean blindness. And a lot of people, they have reactions to this phrase. They feel like they know what it means and they're not exactly on board. And so I want to dispel some myths, which is that Boolean blindness has nothing to do with Booleans being bad. It doesn't mean we hate them or that we shouldn't use them. Because, of course, anything can be stripped of context. Here, I'm using a more expressive type. I'm using a mode that I've described as read and write. So yes, we have some data. We know that we're read writing. But of course, I don't know if this is network. I don't know if this is database. So I'm still in a little bit of a lurch. What Boolean blindness is actually trying to get at is this idea that we should prefer to work with types that have more expressive value. Not that Booleans are bad, but that we may want to use a different tool for the job. And if we put this as a problem statement, what we get is this, that blind types are really prone to errors when we refactor. And people refactor a lot. I know this because I made a Twitter poll, and the internet never lies. <laughs> so it's a demonstrably true fact. Now, I'm not going to offer problems in this presentation which, without, of course, offering solutions. So here's the first useful thing I'll do, which is give you a solution to this problem. I couldn't use words better than this, so I'm directly quoting someone, and I'm going to read it to you. It says, when you have lots of faceless data types in your code, consider painting them with their domain meanings. Make them distinct, make them memorable, and make them maintainable. Now, that's all fine and dandy, but how do we go about doing that? Well, here's another sample from code that I pulled. It's a class, and at the top of the class, it has some variable, and that variable is called header added. Now, lower down in this class that I was reading, there was this function called update item count. And inside that function, there was quite a block of code, but you could boil it down into two main parts, the first of which was acting on the case when the header was already present. If this was true, we started checking the item count, and we would update it, or we would remove it if there was nothing to show. The second block of code, of course, dealt with the inverse, which is when the header wasn't present. And here, we were checking if the header wasn't present and we had items, then we would add it and update it. So 
Together, this was the bulk of the logic. Now, you can probably see why this is problematic, which is that we had a value called header added. You would assume that a Boolean like this is being used to know whether a header has been added. And it's true that it was being used to know whether a header had been added. But it was being used for that purpose specifically because the real piece of data that we wanted to capture was whether the header state matched the number of items that we had. That's what we cared about. And we were using this other Boolean as a proxy for it. So if we go back to that solution of painting types with their domain meaning, we can take a stab at fixing this. Not saying this is the only right answer, but it's one answer, which is to say maybe you create some empty state. It has some link to the type of view that you want to show in an empty state. And then you can have your non-empty state. And in the non-empty state, you guarantee two things. You, you guarantee that you have non-null items, that they're there. And you also guarantee that you always have a header to show with them. And here, what we're doing is we're linking that issue that we actually care about, which is that we maintain the synchronicity between having a header and having non-zero items. So awesome, mic drop. We did it. But of course, if you're looking at this code, you might notice some other things. And you might be judging us slightly. And I don't quite blame you, because I had one of these moments too. Yeah, that's our code. And you're probably wondering how we got to this situation. I mean, we have some forced unwrapped nullables. We're acting on it with the uh, optional later on. It's a little bit frightening. And my point about code like this, and the very specific reason that I put this into a presentation instead of sanitizing the code and trying to appear perfect, was that nobody sets out to write code like this. Code like this happens exactly because of things like this, which is that developers, they work in teams. And teams change shape over time. And so as everybody adds their piece, it makes sense. They're doing their best to make something that is logical and sound. But unfortunately, it's logical and sound within the universe that they're working. And so when you add all these pieces from different developers, sometimes the logic and the soundness of the system overall suffers. And I like to picture this a little like this, which is to say that the strength of your code base and the complexity of your code base, it's only as simple as the simplest piece of code in your architecture chain. So whatever diff you've committed that's the most complicated, that's going to set the tone for the rest of your code. You can have a rock solid piece of code that you're trying to commit to the code base. But if it's resting on something that's a little difficult to work with, a little hacky, a little complicated, it's still going to wobble. It's going to be difficult to really make that sound. You can do it. You can get it in balance. But it's going to be hard. And if you don't believe me about this wild accusation, well, you can think of the case of nullability. With nullability, we have something that's pretty simple. A type can either be capable of containing null, or it can't. There's two options. Like, That's OK. That's great. Look at this awesome thing that we have in Kotlin. But of course, if you work on something like, say, mobile apps, you get into this situation where you can actually have classes be created and then also uncreated. And what this means for you is that you now have a time spectrum of nullability. So instead of saying something is capable of holding a null or it's not, what you're really saying is, at some point in time, this becomes incapable of holding a null. And that's a more complicated thing to say. And again, this is nothing against app life cycles. They're necessary. They're there for a reason. But it is to point out that things like late init and delegates.notNull, they add complexity. And they're doing that because they're building off of something that is inherently complex. Of course, on the flip side of the coin, if you start with something that's rock solid, it becomes really easy to build other rock solid concepts on top of it. And that's what this talk is about today, is how all of these million of little details will set the tone for an app makes you feel a lot more like this. So let's dive into the second scene. Fortunately, we're not going to linger on Booleans anymore. We're going to go into types, because they're useful for other things as well. Shocking, I know. So specifically, what I want to call out is that Types have the ability to store tests, and they have the ability to store pieces. And what I mean by that is you can use something like this nullable. And you can 
test it by saying, is it equal to null? And you can get back two streams of information. You can get back the branch that is always null, and you can get back the branch that is never null. So these are pieces of information and the test that gets you to each. And again, quoting people that are far smarter than me in this area, what we're getting at is the fact that parts have separate meanings, and, and they're kind of breaking the data up into them. And so the types, they're helping us express these different parts. And if we revisit an example from earlier, that one where I was giving the Boolean for can autoplay, you can imagine a world that works something like this, which is that instead of having a single Boolean, we now have interfaces, uh, something that your class can conform to to say that it is a high-end device, or most importantly, to say that it's a cat video, because we know that nothing is worth autoplaying unless it's also a cat video. And so you can get into this situation where now that Boolean turns into something like autoplay eligible, and states can conform to that, and they can be autoplayable if they conform to an interface. Now, when you go to work with code like this, you still have can autoplay. It's there. All you have to do is ask if it's autoplayable. So that information is exactly where we need it. But now, you also get all of the other bits of information that you calculated. Specifically, you already tested against this concept of high-end device. And now you can get that information back very easily. If you compare that to this case, where we have our you know, non-itemized Boolean here, and we have two bits of data that we're encoding into it, you'll notice that it's a little bit harder to get data out of that. So specifically, here, if we reach inside of a can autoplay loop and we want to know whether something's a high-end device, what can you do? Well, of course, you can just use it as a high-end device, because what could possibly go wrong? But of course, this is a terrible idea, because something that's true right now, it's not going to stay true forever. So where does that lead us? Well, another thing you can do, kind of the natural thing to do, would be to test it again, to ask once more, despite the fact that you've already calculated once, is this a high-end device? And of course, this works. But it is doing redundant work. So you hear this term and terms like it so often, things like composition over inheritance. People love to talk about this. And at the root of sayings like this is this idea of reusability, of the way in which you can take data that you've calculated once and make it available to yourself over and over and over again so that you don't have to do it again. And this leads to the second problem statement, which is that Without these expressive types, you can't capture the work that you're doing. So what is the solution? Well, when you break up chunks of work, make sure to capture them in a way that you can recover. Specifically, the TLDR is make use of your type system to be reusable. So I use this interfaces as an example because it was easy. But it's not the only way you can do this. There's a whole class of problems under like a memoization sort of arena where you can have proof of work or something else that you've calculated that you're building upon so you don't have to do every branch or every node in a tree, something similar. So while I use interfaces as an example, it's by no means the only way to do this. Now, I just touched on type reuse. So let's touch on a different type of reuse. I'm not sure how many of you browse the internet in your spare time, but around about a year ago, there was a very good hashtag, and it was called the Internet Names Animals. And what this hashtag did was it took common English phrases and it applied them to animals. So an animal that has a name that might not have much meaning got a much more descriptive definition. So. The porcupine became the stab rabbit. The snake became the danger noodle. Kangaroos were hot pockets. Mooses become forest-dwelling murder horses. We have the American murder log. And of course, everyone's favorite, the raccoon, is really just a trash panda. You heard it here first. Now, we're all developers, so I know that it goes without saying Making accurate names is really beneficial to society. This is something that we're bought into. Our community understands hashtags like this. And so I want to be a good society member, and I would like to propose my own. <laughs> 
which is to say that the type formerly known as strings probably could be better known as the alphabet uh-ohs. Yeah. Now, the reason for this are that strings are danger. And of course, danger is not always bad. People spend exorbitant amounts of money to get thrown out of planes with a glorified bedsheet tied to their back. So there's got to be something worthwhile in it. But it doesn't change the fact that strings are dangerous. And the reason for the danger, well, it's not them, it's definitely us, which is that we suck at typing. And you know, it's not entirely our fault, because if you look at even the shortest, simplest string, say, two characters, and you do out all of the permutations of this string, and in fact, I'm taking a severe underestimate. I'm saying the 26 lowercase letters of the English alphabet when I'm making this estimate. Even with an underestimate like that, you have 676 options, only one of which is the one that you actually intended to use. If you go to any normal size string at all, you quickly get into a scenario where the number is so large that I can barely fit it on this 16 by 9 aspect ratio screen. That's problematic. Now, I know at least one person in the audience right now is really good at math, probably majored in statistics, and is saying, that's not really accurate because keyboard layouts. And yes, it is very unlikely that if I'm typing a string over here, I magically like, start typing strings over here. I get that. But infinity divided by a large number is still a heck of a lot of ways to screw up. So why do we care? Well, because we're often matching on content. So when I make a typo in a string like this, my data doesn't go where it needs to go. My states don't transition in the way they need to transition. It's problematic. So how do you fix this? Well, of course, there are two tried and true solutions, which is don't type strings. And as part of don't typing strings, especially don't type strings in places you don't actually really need them, like state. Now, again, this is not a talk about strings being bad. Look at this perfectly great use case for a string. But objectively speaking, I think it's fair to say some use cases for strings, they are pretty bad. Yeah. And of course, if you're feeling clever, you might clean this up a little bit, right? Because I said, don't type strings more than once, because the more you type strings, the more you mess up. So here, we are typing the string only once. But of course, this is still terrible, because if you had a user, they could, for instance, set this variable string to the word anarchy, chaos, doom, you know, just to name a few examples. So this leads us to problem 2.5, which is that strings are easy to mistype. And well, what is the answer? Avoid typing them. Now, this is near and dear to my heart, and I want to make absolutely sure that people you know, remember this and practice this. So I've created this very handy meme for you. Strings are for data, not states. You can post it anywhere you want, it's fine. Next big thing, you saw it here first. And of course, a lot of you are probably looking at my diatribe on strings and you're saying, okay, old news. We know strings can be dangerous. We know not to type them more than we have to. And of course, I wouldn't bore you with something like that unless I had an alternative point, which is that the way we treat strings and the knowledge that we've accumulated around strings and their use, it's actually a far too narrow reading on the actual problem. To understand it, we get to do a bunch of math. I know, you're excited. It's fine, you can hold it in. Uh, we'll start with Booleans. And basically, all I want to know is how many things can a Boolean hold? Here it's easy, two, true and false. Now, I can go ahead and have a pair of Booleans, in which case I can put one of two values in the first slot, one of two values in the second slot, and get myself into a situation where I have four options. And you can see the natural progression of this, where now I go through and I have tuples, and I have eight objects, or eight different options. 
And of course, this is all using bools, where I have two options for each slot. I don't need to do that. I can modify this and use unit, which is an object. And so there's only one possible solution here. And so here, I have 2 times 2 times 1, and I'm just getting back my four options. And the point that I'm trying to get out here is specifically around how the types we use contribute to the combinatorial multiplication of possible states. So we know that unit is 1. We know that Boolean's complexity is 2. Where does that leave us with strings? Well, if we take that pair example again, and we put the easiest possible thing in the first slot, we put unit, so it could only be one thing. What is the number that we get in the second slot? Well, I'm sure you've already made this leap, which is that it's nearly infinite. You can put in an empty string. You can put in a string of one character. You can put in a string of two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can have them in all their permutations. We get to a situation that's roughly infinite. Now, again, the question is always, why do I care about this fact? And the answer is that something that takes a string also takes almost infinite like, possible input. And it's really incredibly highly unlikely that whatever API or function we're designing will handle every single one of those cases gracefully, which means that we're actually designing a function where it's possible to pass things that we don't have any idea of what to do with, which more or less means that we're handing people the key to our own self-destruction. Now, this is basically the programming, programming equivalent of a trust fall. And the only thing that I want to say on the topic is that YouTube has an entire genre of videos called Trust Fall Fails. <laughs> so you can make of that what you may. OK, so that leads us to problem three, which is that unbounded types make it difficult or nearly impossible to limit our state representations. What's the solution? It's to quickly, as quickly as possible, lift unbounded types into a bounded type, to wrap them, to kind of hide them away where they can be less danger to you and to the other programmers in your org. So what does this look like? Well, if we revisit the example we had earlier, you can see here that we have our unbounded type, that string. We've now lifted it into something that looks like this. It has exactly two options. You can have your production or your testing endpoint. When you go to use it, you'll notice that there are no strings on this screen. So awesome. We've made an improvement. It's not foolproof, but it's a little bit safer. Now, this is not a one-trick pony, of course, because strings are not the only types with this behavior. You could also take a look at something like int, where you get into this similar infinite possibility realm. And of course, I know someone is now thinking in their head that ints are not infinite. And yes, you're right. There is a limited number of things that they can represent. But it turns out when you do this multiplication, it actually forms a number so large that I didn't know the name of it. I had to Google it. It's quintillion, by the way. Uh, so if you want to test all cases, that's the number you should be aiming for. Now, of course, we can do something about this in much the same way we did something about the string case, which is you know, constraining it to three valid options. Or say, doing something to prefetch frequency, where once again, we constrain this to only the two options that we really care about. If you take these two things in concert, what you end up with is something that looks like this. We've now taken that same concept and encoded it in a way where it can only have uh, six possible permutations. And this is great, because six as a number is testable. We can go through each one of those in a way that we couldn't, that very large number that I couldn't even count to. So I don't know about you, but turning infinity into six feels a little bit like magic to me. And it leads us to scene four, which is probably my favorite of all of them, illogical data structures. Now. Uh, this may sound weird and scary, or you may be wondering, is this a made-up term? I don't know the answer to that question. I think it might be. Uh, but don't worry. We'll go over it. And so specifically, what is the idea of an illogical data structure? Yeah. You already know where I'm going with this. I probably don't need to spell it out, but I will anyways. So here is the simplest, most rudimentary illogical data structure you could possibly get. 
which is that you have a lock, and it has a field for being open, and it has a field for being closed. Now, this works out for you sometimes, but it quickly goes awry when you get Schrodinger's lock, and you can have it be both open and closed at the same time, or neither open nor closed. I don't know what to make of that. It's above my pay grade. I'm sure someone in philosophy has some ideas. But the thing that we care about is that illogical data structures, they're data structures that allow nonsensical values. For instance, a lock being both open and closed. Now, a more subtle version of that may be something like a person model. You'll notice everything here is a variable, and some of them are nullable, and we have sets. And we can use this as a training ground for identifying some things that make up illogical data structures, like probably the fact that some things can change that really shouldn't change. Last I checked, science did not yet have the possibility to do head transplants, so heads should probably not be variable. You most likely have one and will have that one until the day you die. So there's other stuff, though, which is that things can be missing that should not be missing, I have not yet met a person who does not have a heart and is still attending talks. So that's probably a thing that you need in some way, shape, or form. And of course, there's also this problem where you can have things more or less than you, you need. So for instance, maybe having six arms is not the most accurate way to represent a human. So ways in which we can fix this, well, you can make things vowels when they shouldn't be changing. Uh, you can make them non-nullable. So for instance, here, heart stays variable because people have heart transplants all the time. Uh, but head is a vowel, and both of those are null because you need them both to survive. And you can see that we've defined our arms and legs such that we represent people who have no arms and legs, we represent people who have all four, but we're not yet capturing people who have six. If you find one, I would love to meet them, and I will revise this slide. Now, what does that look like in more realistic code? Well, it looks something like this, and it's quite a bit more subtle. So what this code is doing is it has a model, and then it has some field that was calculated on that model. So specifically, the way this field, the imageless review field, is calculated is if the model has a URL for an image, then this Boolean gets set. Now, this is problematic in two really key ways, which is that, well, First, it relies on the model not being null. And you can see that this is starting out as false. So actually, it's lying to us right from the get-go. If there is no model set, then this should not have a value. We can't say that it is not an imageless, or that it is an imageless review when there's no model. There's no review to be imageless. And so this is a lie. This is incorrect. And also, of course, it allows things to get out of state or out of sync. So what you have is when the model gets set, maybe you forget to update this Boolean. And so now you have a model that has an image URL, but your Boolean is reporting false. And you have this illogical data structure where these things, they're not in sync. It's allowed to take on this nonsensical value. So again, we can take a stab at fixing some of these things. One solution looks like this, where we define the imageless version, and then we define one that has an image. And you can only be in the has image state of this review type if you guarantee an image URL. Now, you can also add some helper functions to it, which is not very important, but kind of ports over the logic. And together, when you go ahead and use something like this, it turns into this. Now, it's not perfect, but you'll see that at least we've addressed some of the illogical data structure flaws, which is that now you don't ever have the chance to get states out of sync. The model has a URL. It's going to also report that it has image. Likewise, with an initial model, this will always be correctly set. Uh, what your initial model is is up to you, but at least we know where the data is coming from. So, Always, always, always the question is, why do we care? And the answer for this one is, if you've ever, just like me, gotten a bug report that you could only repro when you tapped a button eight times, quick switched the app, returned to the app, jumped up and down twice, and then force quit, yeah, that's why. That's the reason. Because users are users, and they do unpredictable things, and 
you really can't make assumptions about how they're going to use the code that you write. Because if the code is at all theoretically reachable, it's going to be executed at some point. Really fun story about this is that we just had a you know, series of unfortunate events where in our app we have things behind dev flags, so only developers have opportunities to use them. And through this series of terribly improbable, one-off, tiny mistakes, it came out that our users had access to our dev options. So even this thing that we were really, really sure would never end up in the hands of users ended up in the hands of users. And so when we encapsulate this into a problem statement, we get something like this, which is that assumptions aren't enforceable, and they age really poorly over time. And so the solution to something like this is, well, if you need something to be unreachable, you have to do it at compile time. So again, what does this look like when you pull code from a real project? It's more subtle than the, the toy examples. One example is we had a video cell. So if you are scrolling through a feed of objects in Android, we would use something like a recycler view. You want to show a video in one of those cells. You have this situation where the cell continues to exist in some reuse pool, even though the data is not bound to it yet. And so the life cycles, uh, as they match up to the data, can get a little complicated. And so us being you know, forward thinkers said, there is a tool for this job. We can just say that the data is late in it. Because on bind, it's going to be called, and the data will be there by the time we're actually using it. So you know, when the cell comes on screen and it gets bound, the data is going to be there. So this is a safe thing to do. And of course, you may not be surprised to hear that there were crashes for everyone. And why? Well, unsurprisingly, the reason was because the code base changed, product requirements changed, and assumptions were broken. Now, when we took a stab at fixing this problem, we started back with the requirements. What did we actually need? Well, when this was loaded, when we could verify that the data had fired off, we needed it to be accessible and non-null. And then when it wasn't loaded, we needed to know that the data couldn't be accessed. So how did we represent something like this? Well, again, you've seen this structure so many times. It's the easiest one to show on a slide. Not the only one, but the easiest. We can have a state that says not loaded. We can have a state that says loaded. And within the loaded state, you can get exclusive access to the data that you've loaded. When you go to use it, this completely takes away the opportunity for anybody not in the loaded state to access your variable. Of course, you may be wondering, why would anybody not in the loaded state need access to this? And the answer is always logging. It's where good architecture dreams go to die. So yes, things like this that seem safe, they can have these inherent flaws in them that only become evident over time. But it is worth pointing out that there are other reasons that it's really tempting to use things like this. Specifically, when you say that something's late in it, you only have to do it once. And then you can go off in this world and pretend that it's never null. Um, and it only actually matters when it crashes. But you only have to do it once, and the rest of your code is fine. Now, something like this, if you start to pull those states out, well, Every time you reference that state, you have to unfurl it. And of course, this is more work, and it's not exactly fun. Now, you know my stance on this, which is to say that at least doing this explicitly gives you control. Because even with late in it, you are doing this. You're just opting in to the default behavior, which is that when I'm not in a loaded state, I should crash. And Maybe that's not what you always want to do. OK, this brings us to our last scene. In order to understand the point that I'm going to make, it's probably worth refreshing from where we've been. 
which is, you know, I had this suggestion about painting types with their meanings, and the answer was data classes or something like that. And I had this suggestion about encoding information in reusable ways, and it was interfaces, and I prefer working with bounded types, came up with classes and enums, and then, you know, the thing about nonsensical data and illogical data structures, well, you could go ahead and use mutability and nullability constructs. But if you noticed in all the examples, the TLDR of this talk really could have been summed up in three easy words, which is sealed classes everywhere. Yeah. And of course, I use them because they are a bounded construct. When I'm talking about the dangers of state being propagated in numerous ways, using something that's bounded is a really attractive solution to that. But one problem that arises in this scenario is this elephant in the room. Now, people who work on the little green robot, like I do, probably know exactly where I'm going. But even if not, perf always matters to the work that you do. And you know that it matters because we do terrible, awful things like this when we have really, really nice looking code like this. And the reason we do that is because at the time, it felt like a way that we could be more performant. And this is something that we need to do oftentimes. Now, I would like to sum up our current state of affairs something like this, which is that we have the most performant way we can write code. We have the most readable way we can write code. And then we have our expansive anguish. Yeah, now this is not always true, but oftentimes it can feel like it is, which is that when you want to write performant code, it doesn't always mesh with the type of code that's most easy to read or most easy to maintain. And so again, I have no intention of making the point that Booleans are bad, that strings shouldn't be used, or that classes are always the answer. My point here is that with most things in life, there are trade-offs. And so, yes, ints are very performant, but they also allow quasi-infinite states. And the question really becomes, which is more dangerous to you? If you have a stellar code review system, if you take pride in it and you know you're going to have six pairs of eyes on your code and they're going to catch your mistakes, or if you're working on perf-critical code, maybe graphics, then ints make a lot of sense. But if you are in a large, diverse, dynamic company, or you're writing code where making a mistake is catastrophic, looking at you, medical industry, then having a strongly opinionated alternative might make a lot more sense. So of course, the decision is always yours. And the only thing that I hope for you is that after attending this talk, you have what you need to make it an informed one. Thank you.